Hello everyone. The story I want to tell you today started about eight years ago, uh, just a few months after my daughter was born, when we ran out of water at home. In the many decades that my family has lived in this house, this was unprecedented. Uh, we had drilled past 500 feet in the bore well in our house, and a friend joked that we were essentially mining for water at that time. But that year, that mine ran dry. Across Madurai, the town where I live, many such bore wells began to go dry. At any other time, we might have just bought water from a tanker, as so many of us do across India, and left it at that. But I just had a child, and with a difficult pregnancy and delivery behind me, I had to take time off, which meant I had time to ask the questions, why was this happening? And second, what can we do about it? As I traveled and read and spoke and so, I learned about a change that was unraveling all around us, a global change that we were moving past our climate guardrails. I learned that these past 10,000 years had been a period of relative calm in the history of our planet, a calm that had allowed agriculture and civilization as we know it to evolve. I learned about greenhouse gases. They have a peculiar quality to them. They allow the sun's rays to pass unimpeded through the skies and warm the planet. But as the planet heats up and tries to release some of the energy back into space, those gases block some part of that energy, thus heating the earth. Disturbingly, I learned that some of this warming has been baked in. That is, it's not so easy to reverse. And that's because a fraction of the gases once emitted stays up in the skies for a long time, sometimes hundreds of years, continuing the warming trend. I learned that India, my country, because half of our population lives and works in farms that are exposed to the skies, and with a very unique pattern of rainfall, ranks amongst the most vulnerable countries to this warming climate. Our planet is warmed by about a degree, Many of you in the audience may be thinking, that's not a whole lot. But that one degree is enough to supercharge the water cycle, which results in melting glaciers, rising seas, more powerful storms, and paradoxically, at the same time, drying regions seeing less rainfall. In the years to come, Chennai may be concerned about more powerful storms, while Mumbai, where so many of you are, and Florida, may be concerned about rising sea levels. On the other end of the spectrum, Rajasthan, parts of Tamil Nadu such as where I live, Australia or the southwest of the US, may be concerned about falling rainfall, drought, even forest fires. Clearly, climate change is going to affect all of us, but it will affect each of us differently. And that is very important. I want you to keep that in mind because it will become important later. Now, back in 2014, this was not a hot topic. So I began to teach what I knew at a local school. One of the greatest gifts of teaching, and I, uh, one of the greatest gifts of teaching is the learning a teacher herself gets. And um, in that class, as a final project, I'd suggested to the students that they hold a climate rally. But one student objected. I don't want to be another person holding a placard, she said. For me at that moment, the penny dropped. A like or a share is not enough. You know, as we move from awareness to action, it is time to act and it is time to leverage the power of local action. You know, and that's especially important because the choices we, you and I make, are so instrumental in causing the problems that are sometimes blamed on the warming climate. Take, for instance, our floods. No doubt the warming climate, which brings more intense rainfall in its wake, has a role to play. But would the blow fall so hard if we hadn't built over our local water body or lake or dumped rubbish into our drains and rivers? I doubt it. Which brings me back to the day zero situation in my house. Realizing that our water situation, our water troubles had something to do with the global uh, warming problem made us pause. 
uh, clearly this capricious pattern of rainfall was not a one-off. It was not going to go away. So if we wanted to stop buying water, we had, we had to do something about it. But when we asked, what can we do? We realized we had no clue as to how or where we were using our water. So to answer that question, we installed meters in the house and which showed us how we were using, misusing and abusing our water. Soon in a few weeks after months of opaqueness and darkness, there was light on where to act. But now let me come to the how. In coming up with solutions to address the water problems, we focused almost entirely on something that was easy to do or economically beneficial. Why, you may ask. In my experience, conscience is not the most reliable ally when you want to sustain a behavior change. Um, look to your own life. You know, in, when you're sending the kids off to school, in the hours before a deadline, in the minutes before you're setting out a meal on the table, trying to be mindful of the kitchen tap can be difficult, if not impossible. So we tried to get to the desired behavior change through design. And um, once our meter showed that, you know, one of the problem water guzzlers in the house was the kitchen tap, we took a leaf out of South Africa's playbook and reduce the pressure of the water leading into the kitchen tap. This is cheap and easy to do. It can be done with the help of your local plumber. Et voila, the kitchen water consumption fell by a half. There was no need to ask anyone to be mindful of the tap. Another area that the meter showed was a problem was the garden in our house. In 2015, I had spent some time in Israel trying to understand what allowed a desert nation to export virtual and sometimes even fresh water. You know, taking a page out of that, we installed differential plumbing in our house. Uh, again, this is not very difficult or expensive to do. It just allows different qualities of water to be used for different purposes. The kitchen and the wash basins in the house got treated water, you know, the highest quality the flushing uh, in the toilets and washing dishes got the second quality of water and the garden got the lowest quality of water. In the factory where I work, we installed a sewage treatment plant. But again, keeping convenience in mind, we went for a technology that required no maintenance and very little operational expenditure. You know, and that's really important because so much of the sewage treatment technology across the country is either underfed or not working. But in our factory, as the climate warms, we find this treated water to be one of the most powerful allies we have in dealing with this warmer climate. The other things we did were to install a drip irrigation uh, system. You call your local dealer, he'll come and fix it. It's really, it's surprisingly inexpensive. But the Probably the best thing we did was use compost in our soil. Compost is black gold. It transforms your soil to using less water and sucking up the water and delivering it right to your plant roots. And the beauty is the compost was made from our own food and garden waste. Without knowing, we were actually tapping into the power of the circular economy to build resilience. Soon the garden began using less and almost non entirely non-fresh water. And all of this change was achieved entirely through design. And that design was driven by local knowledge. After this and some other changes, we stopped buying water. But in 2017, a few years into our journey, the worst drought in over a hundred years came to Madre. The lowest rainfall in living memory at that time, when all around us were buying water, neither in the home nor in the factory did we buy any water. To us, to me, this was an aha moment. Climate change had not stopped. Its talents were as sharp as ever, but we had become more resilient. Local actions clearly had power. This is not an isolated story. This is the same principle that local actions have power, that is imbued and embodied in every one of the stories and heroes in my book, The Climate Solution. 
including you know, Israel and Singapore's success with managing their water. Clearly, local actions, when they are driven by local knowledge, local incentives, and local economics, have a power to speak to global climate change. I am not saying, and this is not to say, that global action on cutting emissions is not enough. It is crucial. And if, if there is anything I've learned, the sooner we do it, the easier it will be. All I'm saying is some of the lifting is better planned at the local level. So what's the big idea? In the post-Paris, post-Greta world, there is widespread awareness and a need that we need to act on the climate emergency now. But who is we and how do we act? Especially, you know, you recall that climate change affects different regions and different people differently, which means there is a varied motivation for people to act. A one size global policy is unlikely to be, you know, it, that potent or resonant. Moreover, many of you will know that policy is only as useful as how it is implemented. And implementation can be helped by a policy that is crafted with ongoing ease of implementation and local conditions in mind. And that's where we, you and I, come into the picture. At the level of your home, your neighborhood, your town or city, you have greater knowledge and greater power to craft a solution or a policy that is more resonant, more effective, and dare I say, more convenient in addressing the problem. Acting local first means we have skin in the game, and this is critical. Again, let me go back to my water journey. Did we have problems? Of course we did. The meters can fail, people complain, squirrels gnawed through our drip pipes, meaning we had to uh, maintain them. But because we knew the pain we would suffer if we didn't act, we did the slow work. And by making every action as easy as possible, helped along sustaining the change. The planet is heating as we speak. Let us also recognize that local actions have caused some of the problem in this issue. And let us also recognize that conscience, while it's useful to spur a change, requires the help of design in terms of ease, economics to sustain the change. One way to think of it is like clapping hands, right? Think of the rising global emissions and the warming as one power. And the local choices you make, your local transport system, how you manage your waste, how you cherish your local water body, and how you manage your household's water as your other palm. It takes two hands to clap. And as we wait for the world to get its act together on climate change, let us recognize the power in our own hands. Let us act locally by design.